to episode two uh, show. We have the Amelia Earhart of the sales world. <laughs> Jill Conrath is our guest today. While Jill never was an aviation pioneer and should be noted, uh, never crashed, she pioneered in many ways the sales profession flying her flag through four best-selling books, thought leadership, and keynote speaking, inspiring Salesforce to name her one of the top sa seven sales influencers of the 21st century, which is in impressive in my book. Um, she continues to inspire the next generations coming up in sales, and we have the honor of having Jill as a guest here at Sales Intersection. Jill, welcome, and thank you for being here. It's a, it's a true honor. Thank you, and it, I've never been introduced that way, and my son, who is a pilot, <laughs> will be so excited to hear me describe like that. <laughs> Well, I, I had to get creative with you, and I thought of you as a pioneer, um, someone that's, you know, never, never crashed, of course, but um, uh, that also started in a profession that wasn't suited for her nursing, and, and then moved on to aviation, and she, I know that you were a high mm -hmm. school teacher, and right. moved on to something that made a little more sense for you. Um, so just to start, I know you've told this story probably a thousand times. Uh, but but uh, hopefully it's probably evolved and the way you think about it has changed and the way you present it has changed. But maybe um, can you tell us how you got into sales, how you became the Amelia Earhart of the profession? What inspires you to give so much to the industry and, and all the people you affect? And, and what, what keeps you going now? Well, that's a multiple, multiple question. Um, <laughs> can we start with the first part? You know, what, start with the first part. What, what got me into this? I got into this business because I was a high school teacher who hated it. I spent a long time trying to figure out what else to do. I didn't get hired, so I decided to invent my own company, roped in a few friends, um, got involved with SCORE, which is a government agency, and, and reviewed a business plan that I put together that I, I had an idea, and I was like, oh, this is really cool, and I knew I was capable of doing it. The guy said, this is great, Jill, but one of you three's got to sell. Who's going to be doing the sales? And every my partners looked at me and was like, oh no, I hate sales. I don't want anything to do with it. But I was the one who was the most um, driven by the idea, wanted to do it the most. So I did volunteer. That was a lifetime ago. I never did start the company that I planned on starting because I had so much fun going into sales. So that's how I got into it. Why did, why did you say you hate, you hate sales at the time? Oh, I thought it was disgusting. My whole image of it was used car salespeople. Um, and, and manipulative, slimy, sleazy scumbags. Other than that, you know, I thought, I thought highly of the profession. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I can understand. I've heard that one yeah. before. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so what, you know, what kept you going? Uh, was it, you know, the reasons why you, you first went into sales, did that soon change? Or what, what um, kind of kept the momentum going? initially. In those well, I found sales to be a fascinating profession. It's the only job in the world where they let you loose to go out and meet with other people and to get into their companies and to find out what they're doing and how they're doing things. It was like the world just opened to me. And I found I was learning so much more than I could in any kind of desk job, you know, where you don't interact with so many people. Plus, there was the challenge. I mean, I had waitressed for many years going through college and high school, and, and I did like the ability to earn my own income. And, you know, the fact that I was able to leverage my income based on how good I got. But I, I think the thing that kept me motivated right away, because I wasn't good right away, I, I failed, you know, I, like everybody else, you screw up when you're learning something new. But I had um, set myself a goal of getting out of sales in one year. I mean, I was committed to do it for one year, but by committing to do it in one year, I decided that I had to become a sponge and learn absolutely everything I could in that 12 month period. So I threw myself in heart and soul because I had to get out of it fast. I had to get out of sales fast. So I threw myself in and, and um, failed and screwed up, but because I was determined to start the company, I, I didn't allow myself to call anything a failure. Everything was a valuable learning experience. Because if I said, oh my God, Jill, you're a terrible failure, not cut out for it, I would have failed really big time. But everything was a valuable learning experience and I would go seek answers. And I would go talk to people and say, here's what happened, how else could I have done it? How else? And I would experiment and try different things. And, and pretty soon I got really good at it. I got to see the different ways of 
saying and doing things, how you interact with people, how you engage them, how you talk about what really matters to them. And, and then it started becoming fun. But I have to say that truly treating it as a one year learning experience and giving myself the grace of a year to learn it and not allowing myself to go, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Because I think the minute you start wavering, I'm not sure if I'm cut out for this, then you stop applying yourself, you back off, you start looking around out there. So by the time the year was over, I had like super exceeded the goals that were set for me. And I was having more fun than I'd ever had in my whole life. Now in those beginning years and, and years to come, it, would you say there's any gap between what you would say your unique value proposition to, to the positive evolution of sales is and what others might say about you? Does that make sense? No. Uh, what, what, <laughs> what, 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 what you feel you, you bring to the table that's unique, that, that adds the most value to the sales profession and, okay. um, and, and what others might say about you and what, what you bring. You know, about 20 years ago, when I got into the speaking business, and I got into the speaking business because I had an idea for a book. And so I started going to these things to learn how to be a speaker. And this guy who was really good and smart at speaking, sat me down after one of the meetings, he said, Well, what are you really good at, that other people in your profession aren't? And I said, I hear customers, I hear customers. Now that may not make sense. But there was a movie at that time, with Bruce Willis and the I hear dead people was part of the, the saying, but I could, I could hear what they were thinking. And so I was, what I was really able to do was to create a mind meld with the customer. I would put myself into their place and I could literally tell if the sales rep said this, they would get that response. And if they, if they changed it and said it this way, they'd get a whole different response. And I, and I could hear what a customer was thinking and project their response before they even gave it, which allows you, by the way, to change your behavior and to show people how to change. And so I guess when I got into the sales training business and working with clients, what I was really trying to teach people was how to, how to really have a mind meld with their customers so they could look at things from the customer's perspective and do them right from the first time. And I guess it kind of goes back, I'm gonna go back to my education background. When I was teaching, I learned that there are, are five different levels of thinking. And the first couple levels are really just, you know, you come into a new job and you just have to, you have to memorize things, you know, what is the product and you have to be able to describe what you're doing to somebody. So it's like rote memorization and description, very low levels of thinking. And then you get into the analysis, um, at the application stage. Now you have to pick up the phone and actually practice or do something with a real human being which is using the sales skills and the knowledge that you've acquired, the level above analysis or application is analysis. And now it's thinking, who am I calling on? What position are they in? What issues and challenges what might they be having? So that's the thinking level. And then the next level up is synthesis. It's what can I create? How do I create a conversation, an intelligent conversation with this person? How do I give a really good demo to this person so that it makes sense to them? But it's all about creation. It's creating an email, creating a demo, creating a voicemail message. It's all about creation. And then the highest step in, in thinking is a step called evaluation, which is taking a look at what you've created to determine its value, its effectiveness. And, and that's where you literally have to put yourself into your prospect's shoes and say, if I was a prospect, would I delete this email or would I keep reading? If I was a prospect, and she said this about her product and service, what would my reaction be? Would I be interested or not? If I was sitting through a PowerPoint presentation, would this, would this presentation capture me from the get-go or would I get bored and lean back? And so to me, what I bring is that ability to help people think, you know, realize that they are creators of interactions. And, and, and empathy, empathy there. Seems it's, it's it's empathy and it's strategy and it's it's you know it's like wait a minute if if this person wants to improve their business and this is the way they want to improve it how can I show them you know what what matters to them and how can I bring them in and engage them in the conversation and get them to tell me what they don't think is good about it and yeah. who else they have to engage it's it's really a whole way of just encapsulating everything 
to create the best interactions you possibly can. Yeah. So Jill, this conversation would be remiss without mentioning the, your four best-selling uh, books. And first, I want to ask, uh, what, what was the motivation behind writing these books? Why did you write these books? Um, I wrote the books because there were no books on the market that I needed to help me with the sales problems that I had faced or was facing. And each book um, has a genesis and an actual problem that I faced, personally faced. And so like selling to big companies, um, it was during a period when I had two really large clients. I was working with multiple business units in those organizations and both of them came under pressure from Wall Street at the same time, and they were told to cut costs. And as an exterior external consultant, I was on the chopping block, just like that. And so my business virtually evaporated overnight. And, and both of them said, we'll be back, we'll be back. But it takes a while for a company that's having bad earnings to get their feet together. And then they have new leadership and things change and they didn't come back. So I went, oh my God, I've got to do something. And and I tried calling people and nobody answered the phone. I tried emailing them and nobody responded to my emails. And then I started getting really discouraged and finally realized that it wasn't just my problem. It was an issue that everybody was facing and detaching from it. So it wasn't my problem. This is an issue that salespeople are facing. Then I spent a year researching what does it take to um, secure access to a, a potential buyer within an account. And I created the process for me so I could get my business back. But once I got it back, um, then I went, I went, everybody else needs this. And so that's why I wrote the book. You know, I sat down and wrote the book because the book wasn't out there. I'd searched for the book and I knew that I had a replicable model that people could use to open doors. So that's why I wrote that book. And which, which do you hold closest to your heart, if any? Um, you know, you fall in love with each one at, at, at the time because they, they answer um, your need. But, you know, I think anybody who writes a book, the first one is always near and dear to your heart because it's not something you ever thought you'd do or could do. Um, so, I mean, I really do love selling to big companies. It's really, it's written for the small business who wants to get into large accounts, you know, and it's, it's still, even though it's 15 years ago and the technology has changed, the essence of the book is still 100% accurate. Just except when I wrote it, I mean, I, the book came out in 2005. And I said, there's this neat thing out there called LinkedIn. <laughs> I've heard of it. I mean, yeah, there's this neat thing out there called LinkedIn. And I think it's going to make a difference. And here's some other things online. So the technology sucks in there, but the whole messaging, I mean, I've had people write to me like, a sales expert from the UK, from Ireland, who recently read it again and went, oh my God, what you're saying still holds up. So that makes me feel good that it holds up. Yeah, and I've read your books and I mean, you lay, you, you lay it out there, you know, um, so it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, yours, it's yours really to lose if you don't follow the advice. Uh, I mean, it's <laughs> very pointed um, suggestions and, and advice and, and through your own experience and insights. Yeah. Um, would you say there's any kind of gap between what, you, what comes natural to you and what you can learn in any of these books? I mean, uh, how, much, how much would you say is just, you, you can't, you can't okay. learn in a book? Look, what can I say? Um, I think anybody who's open to learning can learn. Uh, if you remember, I was a teacher before I started this. This is not Jill to do my way and do it. I mean, the reality of it is the books were written. So, I mean, I had like selling to big companies when I wrote it. I had two people who had never sold a day in their life who were running businesses. I mean, they had sold, but they didn't see themselves as a salesman. They were reading it chapter by chapter and giving me feedback because if I got too smart on them, like they, they would, you know, if I'd say, just do this, you know, or whatever, they would go, I can't do that. I'm not a salesperson. So I'd have to go back and I'd go, okay, how did I learn this? I learned this because I failed. So let me share with them the situation that led to this learning and then show them why it works and how it changes things. And so my, my books have been read by people who don't know sales and it's, 
And it's, I mean, people have written to me after reading, primarily Snap and you know, Snap selling and selling to big companies and said, oh my God, I've been trying to get in this company forever. And I sent out an email to the CEO and he got back to me eight minutes later and said, yeah, right. let's talk. I mean, that's the kind, and this is, these are people who don't think they're salespeople. Sure, sure. They're humans. I um, did want to transition and, and get into a little bit of the, the, the pivot. It sounds like you're, uh, you're, you're visualizing um, will, will take place in your, your career over the next you know, two to five years. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you see if you're, let's, let's say the next book comes out in five years, what would that one be about? Well, it won't be about sales. I've completed my mission in sales about writing books. Um, however, there's a lot of things that you learn being in a profession over an extended period of time, which is really how to get, I mean, to me, sales is about getting buy-in or helping people make change. You know, so if you don't think that sales is a profession just to push things on people, but it's a profession it's about you're selling change to a company. And, and so as I look at where I'm going, I'm going, well, I know a lot about to create, how to create change and how to have people see things in new ways and open new ideas to them. And so my intent is to move what I know into more of a social activism type of thing, working with groups to help them do good, do important stuff. Yeah, yeah. I may be romantic, but I like to think of my job as po poeticizing the value of disruptive technologies to those keen on being on the front lines. Um, say that again? <laughs> I, I, I like to, maybe it's a bit romantic, but I, I like to say that uh, as, as an enterprise salesperson in a startup world, I'm, I'm poet, poet, poeticizing the, the value of disruptive technologies uh, yeah. to those keen on being on the, on the front lines. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's not about uh, selling. It's about helping them see a future that they that they could have. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be sensitive to time, so I I, I had some interesting, just kind of um, uh, you know questions that may or may not relate to what we've already talked about. But um, who who are your mentors? Um, I don't have any really. Huh. Isn't that funny? I never have. I did when I first started my career. When I, when I first got hired by Xerox, I had a woman who kind of adopted me. Um, she, and she was my first boss and she just really helped me see that I was capable. But other than that, I have peers that I, that I use all the time for brainstorming and looking at different things, but I wouldn't say they were mentors. I've never had a mentor. I've kind of walked my own path. What about me. in your personal life? Any mentors that kind of guide you in, in how to go about your life independent of sales? Um, I've never really felt I've had mentors. I've had really good people around me, but mentors, I don't, I don't know. I haven't, that's kind of weird, isn't it? Well, for someone that uh, would be probably called a mentor by thousands of people, um, I don't know what, how, how that feels. So, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe you're I mean, doing I'm just going, all I'm doing is going my path, you know, and trying to figure out where do I go? And I look around, I pick up, I mean, I'm talking to a lot of people, I'm doing research and, you know, I'm watching what other people are doing. I'm just really aware. I mean, like, you know, going from Jill Conrath, a nice little consultant in Minneapolis, Minnesota to where I am today, it was not a, an aspiration. It was a process. And so I never, I never said that I want to do this. I was happy doing consulting. I had great clients and then boom, they were gone and I had to write a book. And so, oh dear, I have to write a book. Now what? Yeah. You know, the book wasn't out there. And then I had to learn this and I had to learn how to de develop a website. And then I had to, you know, I mean, just, I'm, I'm, I'm always out there picking and learning from others. I mean, you have, you have boundless energy. Is that just natural or is there something you do in your personal life that really helps that yoga or um, I don't know. You said walking is your meditation. I walk. I walk. Yeah. Every, is that every day or? Um, yeah, every day, but except recently. <laughs> except re recently. Yeah. yeah I had foot surgery, but other than that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing that for 20 years. And you're not doing audiobooks or listening to music. You're just kind of in a zone. 
sometimes I'm doing one thing. Sometimes I'm just walking. Depends what I need. Yeah. But walking in itself is just good for the soul, you know? Yeah, I got you. Um, well, hey, it's uh, coming up on 30 minutes. And I, I know that usually the cutoff for people listening is around mm -hmm. 20 minutes, unless you're mm -hmm. my mom, um, who... who who, continues uh, to listen to the very end to see religiously, your... yeah listens to the end i got a couple of friends too moms are like that you know i do yeah. that for my kid too yeah so she's always got uh, great feedback um luckily it's not like my my first season episode one where i was just bombarded with negative feedback now it's uh <laughs> tis, you know uh just pieces i can uh, you know easier to take but um i've really enjoyed the time today jill i hope you found it uh, to be val valuable use of, of, of your time, 30 minutes. And I will um, edit this and then I'll let you know where I'm going to post it. It's, of course, going to be on the, the website, mm -hmm. salesintersection.com, and then the YouTube page so people can watch it. And then it'll be on all the Apple podcasts, Spotify, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. Um, anything you want to say, want to promote, or you know where to I find I would just you? like to say that if anybody wants any good sales advice, I have tons of resources on my website and they're all free so okay and that's joelconrath.com yeah and it's conrath with a k <laughs> okay got yeah. it got it okay well hey uh 44 000 followers on twitter about 400 000 on linkedin um our guest today jill conrath obviously uh has a following and, and for a reason uh, it was a it was truly an honor again jill to have you on my on uh, season two, uh, episode mm -hmm. two. Um, I appreciate your time and wish you the best of luck in your next endeavor. Thank you, thank you, it's been fun. Okay, I appreciate that. Enjoy your day. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye.